presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The Palestinians held a funeral for the 11 martyrs who died during the wide-scale military operation in Gaza last night. Washington increases its pressures on Turkey so that they would deploy American troops on its soil. And Britain deploys more troops to the Persian Gulf. Today, the British Foreign Office advised its citizens to leave Iraq immediately because of the increased tensions in the region and the risk of terrorist attacks. Furthermore, the British Embassy in Kuwait ordered families of its diplomats to leave unless their presence was essential. Meanwhile, British military buildup continues in the Arabian Gulf, whereas thousands of members of the Air Assault Brigade from the Royal Air Force were deployed to the region. They will reinforce about 40,000 British soldiers already in the Persian Gulf to prepare for a war on Iraq. Moreover, British Defense Secretary Jeff Hahn had declared that his country will reinforce its troops in the Persian Gulf by sending about 7,000 soldiers and 100 planes, including bomber planes. Now with us from Kuwait, journalist Ashraf Fuad. Mr. Ashraf, could you tell us what was the initial response to the British advisory for its citizens to leave Kuwait? And in general, are the Western communities leaving because of the threat of war? The British Embassy asserts that today's advisory is not only to warn of a possible military action against Iraq, but also there is a risk of terrorist attacks that are linked to the political developments in the region. The British advisory was expected, but came a little late. Of course, the United States, as well as Canada and Australia, released a similar advisory in late January. So it was expected. They do have a large community here, 4,500 citizens. It will take several days for them to leave, if they are really leaving. However, the children and wives of diplomats were ordered to leave. It is not a matter of choice for them. They have to leave in the coming few days. Okay, from your daily observation of the Kuwaiti street, could you tell us what is the feeling there? Is there a feeling of war? Are the security, political and military undertones implying that the war is approaching? Kuwait has faced several challenges in the past 12 years. Thus, the city is calm and there is no panic. Although the British advisory is very important and spread very fast, the residents were expecting it and are now waiting for a similar advisory concerning British schools. Nonetheless, there isn't a feeling of panic or fear. Rather, it is calm. The Kali Street is behind me, and people are carrying on with their normal lives. They are not going to the centers to acquire food, water, and things of that sort. However, we occasionally see American and British military equipment and soldiers going from one place to another. The situation is somewhat different from the past several weeks. Egypt and Germany agreed that the Iraqi crisis should be resolved peacefully. The stance was announced during a joint press conference between President Mubarak and German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder after the talks in Berlin on Wednesday. More about the joint press conference in the following report by NAR TV's Nihal Saad. Against the backdrop of a rift between Europe and the U.S., President Hosni Mubarak saw eye to eye with German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder on the issue of Iraq. Both leaders stressed the need to pursue means for peaceful disarmament of Iraq and to strengthen efforts channeled towards that direction. 
Emerging from summit talks, the two leaders confirmed at a joint presser that Iraq's full compliance is the only way to avert war, both warned of the consequences of war in breaking a new wave of terrorism in the region. President Hosni Mubarak reiterated that the Palestinian issue is the crux of all problems and should not be overlooked. He said while talking to U.S. President George W. Bush last week, he told him that the Bush administration will move ahead more strongly on the Palestinian track. The German Chancellor said that Berlin had not shifted its position on war on Iraq. News agencies had reported earlier that Berlin is seeking to mend fences on its Iraq policy during an EU meeting in Brussels last Monday. Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer was reported to have said his country would back the use of force as a last resort as it starts to end its isolation in Europe over forging a common policy over Iraq. However, Mr. Fischer, in an exclusive interview with Lion TV, denied that position. I don't know how do you come to this position because we didn't have changed our uh, position. We are against uh, possible military action. Uh, we want to implement 1441 and 1284, the two relevant Security Council resolutions, without the use of force. Um, uh, we intend to, to continue with our policy in the framework of the UN and of the EU. Uh, and we have not changed anything. It was your statement, sir, after the EU meeting that uh, 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 that uh, Berlin is going to shift its position now, authorizing the use of force if this is necessary. No, we have. Uh, this is a means of last resort. Well, we are not talking about the last resort. We are talking about the next resort. Some of uh, in the international discussion think uh, that the mean of last resort, the. U uh, is the next uh, what w has to be done, and we don't uh, we don't agree. We think uh, that a peaceful solution. Uh, this is uh, our policy. This is our intention, and we will f stick firmly to that. We will not be part of a possible military action. Our policy is to avoid a military action by peaceful implementation. But it must be quite clear that Saddam Hussein must fully comply. And it would be a terrible misunderstanding of uh, the weekend if Baghdad would think that they uh, have time uh, for full compliance. They must fully comply with the relevant resolution. Chancellor Schroeder defended his apparent concession at the EU summit on the use of force as an ultimate means to solve the Iraqi crisis, arguing to parliamentarians from the Social Democratic Party that he had not shifted his position. Mr. Schroeder said the message in the text agreed by the 15 member states was no more than an abstract statement which in no way indicated a change in Germany's vehemently anti-war approach. He argued that the deal struck between member states represented a compromise in which each side had given some ground to reach an agreement. Both Egypt and Germany are in broad agreement that any decision on Iraq should be within the framework of UN Resolution 1441. They both reiterated their commitment to pursuing the path of diplomacy for a peaceful disarmament of Iraq. Nihal Saad, Night of International at the Chancellery in Berlin. In the aftermath of the massive protests, both the European summit and during the NATO meeting, as well as international opinion, has increasingly become supportive of postponing the war against Iraq and giving Baghdad a chance to show more cooperation with the international inspectors. This is the hope of France, Germany, China, Russia, and a lot of other countries. However, the United States and its ally Britain are rushing another United Nations Council resolution that would immediately allow the use of force against Iraq. If the passage of such a resolution is secured, then let it be, or else the United States will lead a coalition of volunteer countries without a new international decision against Iraq. The United States could care less about the millions who walk the streets of America and Europe protesting the possible war. According to White House spokesman Ari Fleischer, this is not the first time that he sees such huge demonstrations and often protesters were proven wrong by history. 
The United States intends to propose another strong resolution to the United Nations Security Council indicating that Iraq is in material breach in regard to disarming itself from weapons of mass destruction. The resolution would also give a green light for a military operation against Baghdad. The potential resolution is still the subject of negotiation between Washington allies and it is supposed to be declared in the coming two weeks. Still, the American President George Bush believes that there is no need for a second resolution after Resolution 1441. He renewed his threats against the Iraqi President Saddam Hussein, saying that the United States would get rid of him and lead a coalition to disarm him by force if he fails to do so voluntarily. The American President believes that Saddam is a threat to the United States if he does not disarm. Meanwhile, negotiations have been taking place in the United Nations yesterday and today regarding the Iraqi conflict. War seems to have been postponed by the pressure of the European population who oppose the idea of war. The British Prime Minister Tony Blair renewed his request for a second United Nations Security Council resolution that would authorize the use of military force. However, he said that the matter needs extended negotiations in the United Nations. He denied that there is a race for war and confirmed that the resolution will be made in the coming weeks. Negotiations for making a second United Nations Security Council resolution are taking place despite the French opposition to such a resolution. Meanwhile, the American military agencies are deeply studying the nature of any possible military attack against Iraq. The New York Times reported that the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, is evaluating a four to five page report about all possible risks of launching a war against Saddam Hussein, hoping that the situation in Iraq will not become similar to that in Afghanistan. In addition, Saddam Hussein may use mass destruction weapons and burn Iraqi oil fields. Military plans still have not been completed, especially in the northern front along the borders with Turkey who insist on receiving economical aid and compensations from Washington before opening its territories for American troops. The United States hopes to resolve this matter in the near future Future, saying that it is time for Turkey to make a decision. It was another day of Israeli aggression against the Palestinians in Gaza Strip. An overnight raid left 11 Palestinians dead. Also, Israeli troops killed a mentally ill Palestinian and a 16-year-old stone thrower in the West Bank town of Nablus. Some of those killed in Gaza were crushed under buildings that were destroyed by the occupation forces. Palestinian fighters went on with their resistance operations and blew up a tank during the incursion. Ambulances hit the road after Israeli explosions rocked the Shuja'iyah district in the eastern part of Gaza city overnight. Ten Palestinians were killed in this new Israeli aggression, which the army claimed was to clamp down on Palestinian operations. They beat my dad up, then they shot him in the head and put a hole in it here. And they beat up my brother and Adham as well in the head. Mourners raged and distressed buried their dead as mourning broke out. Israel claimed the forces were not aware of any civilians who were killed in the raid. Three Palestinian general intelligence officers were killed and five policemen wounded as they were defying the incursion of 50 Israeli tanks backed by bulldozers and helicopters. Three other men, including two brothers in their 20s, were crushed during the demolition of workshops and houses in the area. A school sponsored by Hamas spiritual leader Sheikh Ahmed Yassin was also damaged. The six-hour raid ended at dawn, but only to resume one hour later. Gaza, which plunged into darkness, was flashing as machine gun fire and explosions were heard during clashes between resistance fighters and the Israeli occupation forces, whose armor rolled into Tufah neighborhood. Four Palestinians, including a policeman, were shot dead and another 20 wounded. The overnight raid came just a day after Israeli Defense Minister Shaul Mufaz vowed to hit hard at Hamas group after it blew up an Israeli tank in the West Bank, killing the four soldiers inside. Since the operation on Saturday, Israel killed eight members of Hamas. 
The group, however, did not back down from conducting more operations, even when they were coming under direct attack. A member of its armed wing blew himself up next to an Israeli tank. Hamas named the martyr as 22-year-old Abdel Karim Bakrun. Other group, the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, said it had blown up an Israeli tank. Some units blew up and destroyed a Merkava tank. This tank was crossing a sand barricade that was laid out by members of the Al-Aqsa Brigade. While this tank was crossing, members of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade carried out the attack. There is a number of wounded and the Israeli tanks are firing in every direction. In the West Bank town of Nablus, occupation forces shot dead a 16-year-old Palestinian stone thrower. Mohammed Saber was killed when Israeli soldiers patrolling the reoccupied city fired live bullets at a group of teenage boys. This came after a mentally ill Palestinian who was wandering in the streets was killed early Wednesday. He was named as 32-year-old Nasser Abu Safiya. The spiritual leader of Hamas, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, commented on the latest Israeli massacre killing, saying that Israel must pay the price. He added that the Israeli aggressions left Palestinians with no choice but to defend and resist. The Israeli enemy has lost its mind. They are like an angry bull. It's following a policy of destroying houses when people are inside, also destroying a school with its furniture, which means they have no morality. Let the world see these sort of people who have no morals. Some people here think that the more we raise the white flag, the enemy will stop its aggression, but the more we give up, the more aggression we get. We have no other way but to defend and resist by using all means of resistance against the enemy to make them pay for the cost of their crimes against our people. We have to make them pay the price sooner or later, and our people are capable of resisting even though they don't have the means to do so. Top Palestinian negotiator Saab Arakat warned that Israel may take advantage of the world's preoccupation with Iraq and move to destroy the Palestinian Authority and reoccupy the entire West Bank. He was speaking in London at a conference on reforming the Palestinian Authority, and the conference brought together Palestinians and Israelis under the auspices of the International Quartet. Israel's chief delegate said the priority should be to end attacks on Israelis before discussing reforms. And British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw and UN Special Envoy to the Middle East, Terry Rod Larson, both welcomed the announcement of Chairman Yasser Arafat to appoint a Prime Minister. During the meeting, Palestinian Finance Minister Salam Fayyad denied speculation that Yasser Arafat had chosen him as Prime Minister. Fayyad insisted he wasn't a candidate. Uh, I'm not a candidate for this position. I know that this uh, a lot has been said about this uh, uh, in the media. Uh, the fir first things first, what needs to happen first is to create the position. That's where the focus is at right now. Uh, I'm a newcomer uh, to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind there are others uh, who've been uh, uh, there in, in public service who are uh, more suitable uh, for, for the job. In more anti-war protests, Thousands of Al-Azhar University students demonstrated in the Egyptian capital Cairo and the Egyptian security forces banned the protesters from leaving the campus when they tried to get to the streets. This report has more. Amid global demonstrations opposing a U.S.-led war against Iraq, Al-Azhar University in Cairo organized a massive rally in campus where the demonstrators shouted anti-U.S. and anti-Israeli slogans and demanded that supportive steps should be taken to confront U.S.-led plans against the whole nation. We want to assure that the only country in the world that has used the mass destruction weapons is the United States. It used it in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and hit and killed the Vietnamese using the napalm bombs. The United States is the only country that has been using these banned and internationally prohibited weapons. The demonstration burst from different faculties of the university and gathered near the directorate building before it marched towards the university's main gate in a bid to move forward into the streets of Cairo. However, Egyptian security forces banned them and kept the university gate closed. The United States is seeking to strike Iraq under the pretext of possessing weapons of mass destruction, and there it is seeking to crush Iraq using weapons of mass destruction. The thousands of protesters organized a large conference under the name of the Generation of the Sought Victory and called Arab nations to dust off the negativity that has covered it and to activate the necessary mechanisms to stir up the nation's powers.
رئيس الوزراء Prime Minister Ariel Sharon called on Israeli citizens to be calm, confirming that there is no need to panic over the news of a possible American and British attack against Iraq. Mr. Sharon gave a speech while he was visiting the Hef anti-missile batteries. He said that all necessary preparation measures were taken to provide the most possible protection to Israeli citizens. Defense Minister Shaul Mufaz and Army Chief of Staff General Moshe Alon accompanied Mr. Sharon. The Israeli aircraft industries and the American Boeing Company signed an agreement in which the American company is supposed to manufacture about 50% of HETS anti-ballistic missiles. The missile was developed in Israel where it has achieved spectacular success. Two anti-missile batteries were installed in the north and central portion of the country. Our reporter Ali Kahil said that the objective of the agreement is to expedite the production of these missiles. The general manager of the Israeli aircraft industry, Moshe Kerr, said that this agreement is considered an important step in improving future production capabilities. He added that Israel will offer friendly countries the last technological advancements regarding the HETS missile. The Belgium Appeals Court decided that Prime Minister Ariel Sharon can be tried for his role in the events of the Sabra and Shatila massacre, which was carried out by the Lebanese Christian militia in 1982. The court decision will take effect when Ariel Sharon is no longer the Prime Minister of Israel, which will end his immunity. It is worth mentioning that Ariel Sharon was a defense minister at that time. While Bethlehem city is still under curfew, Palestinian sources said that the Israeli tanks were present in the city and in the courtyard of the Church of Nativity. The curfew was imposed on Bethlehem after Captain Shahar Shamul, who was 24 years old, was killed. He was killed by the bullets of a Palestinian sniper near the Church of Nativity. Our reporter Miriam Kashbaum said that members of an Israeli unit got suspicious of a car that had an Israeli license plate, thinking that it was mounted with bombs. They ordered the people that were present at the time to leave, and then they detonated the car. Meanwhile, an armed Palestinian started shooting the Israeli soldier, killing the Israeli captain. While the Israeli army was searching for the sniper, the Palestine Popular Front declared its responsibility for the event. In the Ain refugee camp in Nablus, Palestinian sources indicated that Israeli forces were involved in military activities. They surrounded a house where a suspect was hiding and launched a few missiles toward the house. Furthermore, the Israeli Defense Forces arrested 22 Palestinians in the West Bank, including Iyad Khalifa, one of the biggest wanted leaders of the jihad movement. God, the compassion of the merciful. Hello and welcome to your Jama Jam Network News. Iranian Foreign Minister Kamal Khairazi calls on the Persian Gulf littoral states to cooperate to establish security in the Persian Gulf region. Tehran on Tuesday underlined due regard should be paid to peace and security in the strategic region of the Persian Gulf, adding the regional countries will be able to safeguard their long term interests only through judicious and far sighted decisions. Mr. Kharazi then spoke on the international developments and Washington's capitalizing on the September 11 incident and reiterated the United States is using the issue of Iraq as a pretext to bring about regional developments in line with its own interests.
Elsewhere in his remarks, the Iranian officials stressed the Iraq crisis should be resolved through political means and called for promotion of ties with Islamic, Arab and European states in a bid to work out a peaceful solution to the Iraqi standoff. A number of the Iranian foreign ministry officials and ambassadors to the Persian Gulf countries have taken part in the two-day conference. Over 58,000 inspectors will supervise the second round of Islamic City, Town and Village Council's elections nationwide on February the 28th. Iranian Deputy Interior Minister for Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, who also heads the Council's Election Central Board, announced on Tuesday that as of February the 20th, the nominees will launch their electoral campaign. Mahmoud Milo, he went on to say any offenses in that regard will be announced to the related legal sources by the inspection boards monitoring the elections. 1,000 Islamic city councils plus 32,000 Islamic village councils are reportedly active all across the country. Meantime, the Deputy Interior Minister for Development, Mr. Mohimi, declared on Tuesday that entrusting the Islamic city, town and village councils with 23 missions and duties has been ratified at the country's Supreme Council of Administration. In another development, Parliament Speaker Mehdi Karabi on Tuesday invited the nation to massively take part in the country's development and construction via electing nominees who are capable of handling the affairs. Also, Mr. Tajernia, who heads the Central Supervisory Board of the Council's elections on Tuesday, asserted that the electoral campaign will continue until 24 hours before the election, which falls on February the 27th. The 8th gas unit of combined cycle power plant in the south-central Iranian province of Kerman went on a stream on Tuesday in a ceremony attended by Parliament Speaker Mehdi Karubi. When fully operational, the plant will solve the power shortage in the provinces of Sistan, Baluchistan, Kerman, Hormozgan, and Yazd. Also present at the meeting was Iranian Energy Minister Haybullah Bitaraf, who pointed out at the beginning of the victory of the Islamic Revolution, the country's power generation capacity was 7,000 megawatts for a 36 million strong population, while the figure up 4.2 percent currently stands at 30,000 megawatts. Mr. Bitaraf then enumerated domestic capability in manufacturing turbines for the Kazarin power plant, which he expressed hope would play a key role in supplying electricity to the national grid. Now, a brief look at some other important news. The Iranian President Mohammad Khatami on Tuesday sent a message to a gathering held in the country's northwestern city of Tabriz to mark the anniversary of the city's residence uprising on February 18, 1978. In his message, President Khatami also paid tribute to the martyrs of the province, expressing hope that the East Azerbaijan province would take new steps toward development and dignity of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The organization of the Islamic Republic of Iran's broadcasting, IRID, is to launch test broadcasts of the al Anam News Network on February 20th, which marks the Muslims' great feast of Eid al-Qadi. The IRID Vice President, Ali al Madi, announcing that on Tuesday revealed the major objectives of the global news network of al Anam rests upon providing news coverage in Arab and Muslim countries. 80% of the news network programs will be broadcast in Arabic and 20% in English. The news network will officially be aired as of the coming spring. Information on Iran's roads and facilities available on the roads for travelers is now accessible on the Internet. The new homepage offers information on the best route to choose between two cities or towns, the distance between them, and the facilities available on the connecting roads. The website is accessible at www.eronroads.com. And after four years of drought in the country's southeastern city of Zaidan, snowfall on Tuesday gave a new face to the city and brought joy to its residents who were caught by surprise.